I'm going to meet Fergus Beely. Fergus is the next David Attenborough and, unusually for a media lovey, he's a keen falconer. He has made every kind of wildlife film, from incredible sequences in the BBC's Life of Birds series to impassioned pleas for the future of the grey partridge. You may have seen his film on the BBC last year, a highland haven where Fergus followed the fortunes of the black-throated divers and white-tailed sea eagles of Loch Marie. Coming up in this programme, Fergus is going to show me around the Hawk Conservancy in Hampshire. He's going to talk me through The Return of the Grey Partridge, a film he made for the British Falconers Club and the Game and Wildlife Conservation Trust. First, I ask him about his special love. I've always loved birds of prey and uh, that knowledge of, of wild birds of prey has really, you know, sort of led me into an interest in, in, in falconry. And uh, my understanding of all natural history has really come about from certainly, you know, my childhood passion. For, uh, for fishing, for falconry, and you know, the, the love of being outside. So it's been a pretty useful expertise to have? I would say crucial. I would say crucial. You know, I mean, a lot of the filming that we do involves needing to get close to wildlife, you know, understanding their behaviour, understanding how they're going to respond if we do get close, you know, knowing how to use the winds, how to use the cover. Um, I mean, I think that, that, that from a falconry point of view, you know, my understanding of of trained birds has given me a really intimate insight into the wild species. So I feel very lucky to, to, to have gained a knowledge of, of wildlife from my interest in, in uh, sports. Now you've done some films which, which people will know, um, The Life of Birds for BBC, the recent, um, the recent piece about black-throated divers on the west coast of Scotland. Um, can you, give, can you give me an example of, 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 well, particularly from the Goshawk piece in The Life of Birds, that was fascinating, where it chased a pheasant under cover. Well, I think, you know, that, that particular sequence was, was uh, fairly intriguing to me as well, simply because, you know, the Goshawk will move through cover very, very fast. And uh, to me, they, they kind of remind me of a dinosaur. You know, they put their head down and, 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 and very large eyes leaning forward, and they run, you know, with their legs going over the top of their head, keeping their head down, a bit like a spaniel working through cover. And in the wild as well, there's no doubt that when they're chasing things, they go into cover and then chase them on the ground as well. And sparrowhawks do the same. You know, they, get, they crash into a hedge after a bird and then fall through the hedge and continue to chase. Sparrowhawk? Yeah. So when you see them going down the road in front of your car in a country lane, it flips over and, it'll, and it can literally go through the hedge, can it, at that point? Yes, I mean, it can, it can, it can go in pursuit of the prey right into the hedge. Uh, and it won't necessarily just stop on the outside of the hedge, it'll fall through the hedge, it closes up its wings and just falls through the branches um, to the ground and then continues on foot and the goshawk will do the same. So for the life of birds what I was keen to do was to, was to, to, to effectively reconstruct this, this quite specific activity and, uh, and I had a trained goshawk which was my own bird um, and of course I was having to fly it without jesses on uh, and jesses allow you to, to hold on to the bird, and of course without jesses for the filming, um, it was extremely difficult. But we put the camera in various positions on the ground, and it, uh, and it ran past camera, you know, in fact after a day old chick, and, and you know, we were trying to reconstruct the, the scenario of how it would approach uh, and follow, pursue prey on the ground through thick cover. But, uh, I mean, what I learnt, and, and w which was very interesting, was how effective it was at doing that. That, that the cover could be incredibly thick. I mean, some, sometimes there were bramble bushes where the only gap you could get through was, was you know, the, the area around my hand. And, and the goshawk could do it. Straight through? Yeah, straight through. And it was from that on Life of Birds that I realised that there was a fabulous sequence to be done here, which I did with National Geographic uh, some years later, where I constructed an assault course. Mm. And, and created a, um, a sort of a, a wall of camouflage with a very small hole. And I put a high-speed camera underneath it and, and got a, a goshawk to fly through the hole. And it closed its wings up completely uh, and just, just came through very neatly through the hole. And I have to say, um, that's been reconstructed again on more than two occasions. Oh, yes, so it's quite famous. Uh, it's one of the BBC trailers has that. Like that exactly, yeah. exactly. But the original version... Yes. in about 1999 was, was with a very old uh, film camera, a Photosonics camera, and you see the goshawk you know, closing its wings right up into, into, a, into a, a completely cylindrical shape through the hole and then, and then out the other side.
interesting. But to me as a falconer, you know, what I'm doing is really harnessing what is in the wild bird and, and thoroughly enjoying the opportunity to see it in, in, in you know, a, a much closer way. Falconry to me is like sort of organized bird watching. I mean, I can spend hours on the cliffs, yes. on the Avon Gorge in Bristol, yes. as I do every lunchtime. I go up there to watch the wild peregrines. And they go up to fantastic heights, you know, and then, and then stoop and kill. But once in two weeks, you see a spectacular sight. Yes. But when you're flying your own peregrine, you know, you get the opportunity to see that daily. And, and that, to me, is what falconry is all about. I, I certainly believe that, that, you know, good falconers in this country have a very, very great interest in all the natural world. All wild species, wild birds of prey, and the prey they take, and it's, it's hugely in our interests to, to make sure that both are looked after. You know, and I, I, I do believe passionately that you know, falconers have a very important role in making sure, for instance, that grey partridge populations in Britain are, are, are built up. I mean, we're losing them very fast. And, and it's probably, well, I think the grey partridge is probably more beautiful than the peregrine. You know, it, it's a, it's a good-looking bird. I mean, I think the grey partridge is, is uh, so well camouflaged, but when it stands up and it, it shows its chestnut. But it's an important species, it's an ecological indicator. You know, it says something about the way we're looking after the landscape. And I, I think that if we look after grey partridges, we'll probably find that great bustards will, will thrive. Yeah. Um, I think it's the right way around. I think that if we make sure that the greys are doing well, we'll get many more insects. And, that, that's and the release programme on Salisbury Plain, isn't it? It is, yeah. Um, why uh, should falconers have a, a monopoly on the future of the grey partridge? W what about shooters? I think, I think you know, shooters have, have as much say. I think we've all got a say uh, on the basis that, that what we can do is count them. You know, the problem we've got now is that we simply don't know how many are out there to know whether the numbers are actually increasing. So it's the role of falconers and shooters to, to go out and, and count spring and autumn. I think as falconers we feel a particular responsibility because it has a, a historical relationship with our, with our birds of prey. I mean the grey partridge, you know, we've been hunting in this country certainly way back through medieval times. We have a connection with the species. It's a very important prey species to us, you know, and it would be tragic if we lost it. Mainly due to agricultural intensification, this iconic game bird has dramatically declined in number and distribution over the last 40 years. I've been flying grey partridges since 1978-79 with uh, peregrines in this beautiful area of West Yorkshire and the grey partridge population has declined quite dramatically in that period of time. Unfortunately the grey partridge whilst it's one of the, the few indigenous um, game birds in this country and it's exceptionally beautiful it hasn't reacted well to modern farming methods unfortunately um, the way that the, the farming has changed the grey partridges have suffered hopefully with new sort of conservation techniques and, and our greater knowledge of the of the game bird we can start to look to the future and hopefully the future will be brighter to help halt this decline the British Falconers Club has dedicated its efforts to do everything they can to help restore the numbers of this much-loved species throughout the British countryside. The British Falconers Club has therefore joined forces with the Game and Wildlife Conservation Trust, the GWCT, which is the world authority in grey partridge management and conservation. In 1911, about 35,000 gamekeepers in Britain managed more than a million pairs of grey partridges. In the 1950s, agricultural practices, including the introduction of pesticides, the loss of hedgerows, and a dwindling number of gamekeepers, radically altered the grey's habitat and predator numbers. This resulted in an 86% decline in partridge numbers over the last 40 years, to just 70,000 today, possibly even less. For falconers, an easy way to help partridges is to offer additional food to spring pairs by providing feed hoppers. These have been shown by the GWCT to also help songbirds, such as the yellowhammer, 
to get through periods when food is in short supply. However, to restore partridge numbers, food hoppers alone are like a drop in the ocean. Most importantly, the bird's habitat needs to be restored alongside professional predation management. What most people seem to forget is that suitable habitat needs to be provided all year round, as grey partridges are resident birds. Hence, providing overwinter cover to protect the covers from raptors is as important as nesting and foraging cover, so that parent birds can take their chicks to find the essential insect food they need for survival during the first few weeks of life. Henry Robinson, a farmer and keen falconer, lives in an area where the grey partridge has nearly become locally extinct. As he feels equally passionate about his falcons as he does about grey partridge, he asked GWCT expert Peter Thompson to advise him on how to restore partridges back onto his ground. Looking at that hedge over there, yeah. any hedge where you've got that pale base along the bottom, yeah. it means you've got plenty of good dead grass. Put one there, um, and, and if there are any partridges that are knocking around, it's very often that that will keep them to staying. They've found a good food source, yes, yeah. they, they'll pair up, um, and, and as I say, there's, there's right. about 20 metres from a, a hopper is about where they'll nest. Right. which is amazing. Well, that's, that's, that's and these are lovely, you know, this is yeah, perfect yeah, this, for this, them, this nice. tucked yeah. in underneath yeah. this, yeah. so that's fine. Putting out um, ideally parent reared covers in the autumn, yeah. um, positioned around the estate next door to this good cover, um, and then the following season if they uh, try and breed, that's great. If you get barren pairs, ones that haven't uh, bred at all, then you can actually foster on uh, young partridge onto those and they'll, they'll accept them very very readily um, and their chances of survival are, 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 are excellent. In order to demonstrate grey partridge recovery the GWCT set up an ongoing project at Royston in Hertfordshire in 2002. By improving and establishing partridge friendly habitat where possible, managing predators and by providing additional food, the grey partridges increased from 20 pairs in 2002 to 118 pairs in 2009. Well-managed hedgerows are one of the key habitats at Royston, which provide excellent nesting and overwinter cover. Another key habitat are the specially established beetle banks alongside foraging strips to increase the number and availability of insects for partridge chicks to eat. The insects that overwinter on this bank live in down in the root system, in the dead bits, in this tussocky grass. And uh, they hibernate there all winter, out of the frost and the rain and the snow, and then walk out into the crop uh, in the spring. The other component that's absolutely essential is predator control. And this is a tunnel trap in this case it's a Mark VI uh, fen trap that's in this tunnel. They have to be within a tunnel uh, to comply with the uh, regulations. And this trap is good for catching things like stoats, weasels, rabbits, squirrels and rats. Rats are a major, major problem. The results of a four-year research programme undertaken by the GWCT has shown that where local populations have gone extinct, the best way to re-establish them is to release autumn coveys. This should be followed by fostering juveniles to those pairs that fail to produce their own chicks and are therefore barren. Where that isn't possible, Partridge chicks can be reared under bantams and fostered to a barren pair at an age of approximately three weeks. Barren pairs, no matter whether they're reared or wild, will almost always adopt young partridges because of the species' incredibly strong instinct to stay in groups during the winter months. However, partridges should only be released where suitable habitat has been restored beforehand and where predator management is in place.
There are several ways to produce autumn covies. The best would be to produce a parent-reared family group, in other words, where a pair of captive-held partridges produce their own chicks. Grey partridge declines can be reversed. The GWCT has shown that by re-establishing habitat, providing food and managing predator numbers, that this iconic bird can once again be abundant in our countryside. Although we are very well represented by the Game and Wildlife Conservation Trust, we have a mistrust of quantifying wildlife, and you don't. I think it's, it's a vital tool. I mean, to an extent, it's, it's, it's the, the only tool. And if we can't make judgments from, from quantification, you know, how can we make them? And I think that, that you know, we, we should listen to gamekeepers, we should listen to, you know, those statistics coming in from uh, researchers at Game and Wildlife Conservation Trust. We should listen to everyone with regard to how many people are reckoning numbers are in their so area. So you accept anecdotal evidence like that is, is, is fine? I think anecdotal evidence is better than none. I mean, I think there's a point at which, you know, my mother has a contribution to make. She knows what a great partridge is. And if she sees a covey crossing the road in the village, that's important. You know, we need to know they're, they're in that area. We need to know where they are currently distributed across Britain to, to, to get some barrier as to whether the numbers are going up or down. I don't think, I mean, I, you know, everyone will say um, that, that the numbers have declined. No one's denying that. Mm. Um, and, and, you know, recently, that, I mean, they are really crashing. I mean, I think we've lost something like 90% of the population that we had back in the 1930s. And that, I that, is, that is very significant. And if these birds are ecological indicators, that's saying something very important about the way we're treating the British countryside. We can breed them for release, though, and the shooting community is very well suited to do that kind of thing. I, I mean, this is a personal opinion, but I think that, that there's a point at which, you know, the wild stock is the principal concern. Uh, and uh, that if you've got a, uh, you know, an established wild population, well, you can always boost it. Uh, and, and boost it in consideration with the wild stock that you've got. Um, but I think it needs very careful management to, to simply uh, you know, as, uh, establish a new population for release and, and, and shooting. I think that, that that needs very careful thought. I, mean, I, I think that, that anyone thinking about it should approach the Game Wildlife Conservation Trust, but it's a far more subtle game than it appears. OK, you're a flag flyer for falconry. Yeah. Are there field sports you don't approve of? I would say that there are, there are, you know, approaches to field sports that I, that I feel uncomfortable with. Uh, I mean, as a falconer, I feel very strongly that, you know, we don't need to really kill more than we need to fill, uh, you know, uh, the, 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 the pot for, for myself, for the dog, for the bird. Uh, I mean, being excessive about it is, is bound to end up in, in, in problems. I, I mean, in falconry, it's quite difficult to do, to be honest, because there's a point at which the bird, you know, the falcon will, will feed up and you haven't, you'll never get a kill bird. You didn't hear of 500 bird days in falconry, do you? No. It, uh, it wouldn't be possible. And, and I think that that's where I have a lot of respect for falconry. I know that shooting, you know, there, there are lots of, of walking days where you don't come back with much. You come back with, with only what you can carry and, and no more. And I think that there's a point at which big days, uh, you know, have to be looked at with, re with regard to the environment in which those birds are being taken and how fit that environment is for, for the population being shot and, and, and how they're being looked after, you know, the welfare of those birds. Um, and I think that there's a point at which, you know, having seen wild pheasants in, in Kazakhstan, uh, uh, in, in, you know, on the border with China and the for former Soviet republics. You know, it's a, it's, a, it's a fantastic bird to see in the wild. You realize that when they're feeding down in the valley bottoms, you know, in, in, in the bushes by the stream, and you flush them, they, they're just climbing up the mountainside and they're roosting miles away from where they're feeding. You know, and I think in this country, we should concentrate on the fitness of the birds. We should, we should look at sort of ways in which, um, well, not, not, 
whether it's right or wrong, but just consider the way to get really fit birds is to split the gaps between where they're being fed and where they're roosting much more. I mean, in wild populations in their, in their indigenous countries, you know, you, you realize the distances they're covering. You know, the role, I think, of the Hawk Conservancy Trust is very much to, to, to help educate people uh, as to, you know, the range of birds that survive around the world, uh, the ways we can conserve them, uh, and, and how they um, how they perform, when I say how they perform, you know, how they fit into the natural world and, and the different um, uh, strategies they have for survival. Now you've filmed many of these birds in their natural habitats, would you like to take us around and show, yes, them, I will. show yeah. us a few of your old no, friends? No, I will, I will. These, were, these uh, I filmed in Zimbabwe, but I've also filmed them in um, Kenya. And the lappet face, the one on the left, is probably the most powerful uh, of all the vultures. And, and all the other vultures wait for it, mm. because until that comes in and opens up the carcass, the others yeah. can't get in. Yes. So um, they, can, they can repeatedly get into a rhinoceros hide. Good heavens. He's very affectionate, that one, isn't he? Have you suffered any um, injuries? Well, actually, there was, there was a secretary bird here Yes. that, um, that jumped up and smacked my head. But that, was, that was my fault, not, <laughs> not the bird. Well, what I did for National Geographic was reconstruct it with, a, with, with, with not actually this bird, but a, another bird from here, one called Madeline. And I had a, a plastic snake on the end of a piece of string. Yes. And, uh, and I sort of danced the snake in front of Madeline, and, and she came up and, and boxed it with her foot. And she, she hit the, the head of the snake every single time very neatly on the back of the head. And however much I sort of jiggled it and bounced it, she just whacked it on the back of the head every time. Okay. So then, you know, I realized the best thing to do was put up a slow motion camera, actually on the snake's head, and I, I just did a jiggle. And you see the speed at which the talon goes right into the back of the head. Yeah. yeah. So I was intrigued, and I was just about to um, think it was all over, and I put the snake back in my pocket, and she leapt up and <laughs> came on top of my head, treating me like a big snake. And I realised that it was too early to put the snake away. Yes, he wants everyone, to on everyone again. yelled at me here. God's sake, pull the snake out again! <laughs> so, um, is this an old friend? Yes. I can't. I can't exactly recognise which bird it is because it was about uh, 1998. One of these birds, Jimmy, leaning up on uh, up against the post, um, was a star in in the film because these birds in, in Zimbabwe have an extraordinary feature which is a, a, a double jointed foot. Yeah. And you can't, I mean, if you look at this bird on the post here, its feet seem pretty normal. So normally it would, they would work like that, do they? Yes, exactly, yes. Like, like our arms. But, yeah. but in fact, for these birds, they, they go the other way as well. So they, yeah, exactly. They, they go, and, it, and it looks really horrible um, because what? it looks like the leg's broken, but ah. it's obviously not. And it's, it's a, a specialization which they use to put their arm inside the hole of a nestling bird or whatever and go down to take eggs or nestlings uh, and reach into, in, into the cavity of the tree or, or, or the rock. And in the wild in Zimbabwe, we film them going up a, a cliff face, putting their feet into cracks, looking for bats. Um, and catching bats. Um, but what I wanted to show for a film for National Geographic was just how that leg functioned. So uh, here at the Hawk Conservancy, we, we built a, a, a kind of a hollow tree trunk and w with a hole in it. And I was on the inside, as it were, and the, the gymnogene, the, 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 this bird, Jimmy, came around the far side, brought its foot in to try and take a piece of meat from my fingers. And I moved it down and you saw the, 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 the leg rotating like it was broken. It was really weird. Um, you know, I mean, I think it, it's, it's been very, very important to me to, to understand how to observe the natural world. You know, and from my love of falconry, I do have a perception, I'd say a tuning to the natural world. This is, this is a very beautiful tiercel, a male. Tiercel from uh, the French tiercel, two thirds. And um, this is the leash, and there's a swivel on the end of the jesses. And uh, he's a kind of early shotgun, isn't he? I suppose that's right. In fact, the, 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 the male sparrowhawk is still called the musket, um, you know, in, in reference to that. I, I mean, they're a tiny bird, but um, there, is a, there is a connection to that. And yeah, you're, you're right to an extent. They were an early gun. I mean, they were very effective. You know, the goshawk was known as the kitchen hawk for a very good reason. Yes. I think one could come back with, you know, regularly a couple of rabbits and a couple of pheasants. 
and, and that would have been a, a, a very useful you know addition to the family pot and peregrines as well I mean you know they they uh, should if flown well come back with with um, a couple of a, a brace of partridges whatever there's plenty of game around there's no reason why not <laughs>